Hi, I'm Simon Thorpe. I'm the director of the Brain and Cognition Research Centre in, in Toulouse. And today I want to give you a sort of modified version of a talk I gave a few weeks ago at the Emerging Technology Conference in, in, in Toulouse, which was actually the first time I'd managed to get in, in a single talk my two passions in life. One is uh, trying to understand the brain mechanisms underlying perception and memory, and the other is fixing the economy. I've been working on um, brain mechanisms of perception for 40 years now, including developing um, artificial systems that use brain-inspired mechanisms for image processing. And I'll give you some examples of it in a moment. But I've also, uh, since 2010, been doing a blog on the economy, uh, with, which now runs to over 800 pages and has had over 440,000 visits by somebody. I'm not quite sure who. So uh, let's leap in with the, my work on uh, fast vision in biological systems. I'm going to show you images being presented at uh, 10 images a second, pictures of animals. It's called rapid sequential visual presentation. So here are pictures of animals, and you can probably, you know, your brain processes these images, you can, you can see them okay. And now I'm going to do the same thing, I'm going to throw in one image which is not an animal, you have to spot it. You probably all saw the Mona Lisa. Well, this ability to spot images out of context is something that we do very naturally. Here are some more images um, that most of which you'll probably recognize instantaneously. We have our brains are sort of have large numbers of images and sounds which are, uh, are stored as, as memory traces. So how does the brain do it? Well, we've been arguing for some time that the, the, way, the anatomy and the physiology of the way the brain works means it essentially has to be a sort of feed-forward pass through a, a series of processing stages in the, in the brain with only a few milliseconds per processing step and probably only one spike, a, 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 a pulse from the neurons. The neurons send information as a spiking sequence. Uh, 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 but it's so fast that it really has to, uh, has to be feed-forward. Now, can we make a machine do the same sort of thing? Uh, and can we reproduce human levels of performance? Well, I must admit, until, until recently, I would have said there was no way, you know, human vision is just too good. But there's a thing called the ImageNet Challenge, which is used for, for uh, testing artificial vision systems, in which you get given 10 million training images with tens of thousands of, of labels, you train up your system, and then you get tested on a series of new images with a thousand labels, and you, you know it's the, the system that gets the best performance that wins the challenge. So this is performance on ImageNet um, up until 2015, and you can see um, those blue dots, uh, this is performance of systems using what we might call traditional computer vision uh, methods, uh, which never got above about 75% correct. But in 2012, this, this system called Supervision totally wiped the, the, the floor with the other systems, the green dots now. These are deep learning systems that are essentially just a, a, a sort of feed-forward neural network architecture, very much as I, was, as I had been arguing on the basis of the anatomy and physiology of, of our own visual systems. And these systems, you know, until 2015 didn't surpass human performance, but this is human performance about 95% correct, and from from 2015 onwards, these these sort of uh, these uh, deep learning systems have superhuman levels of performance. Um, the result of this was that Jeff Inton and his two students who who developed supervision in 2012 started a uh, a company called DNN Research, which was bought by Google for apparently hundreds of millions of dollars. There's Jeff Hinton and Yann Lacan, one of the pioneers of feed-forward convolutional networks since the, the 1980s has been hired by Facebook. Now, uh, from that time on, the, you know, the deep learning startups have been appearing all over the place in all sorts of areas. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a, a li recent list of, some of the, just some of the companies that have been, been created in the last couple of months. So the thing is just taking over here. And you can now buy uh, chips uh, for doing deep learning. Um, Mavidius was a company that was bought out by Intel last year, and, you, uh, and they're, they're, they're marketing a sort of USB uh, neural compute stick that you can plug into your laptop, $79. It has a chip called the Myriad 2, 
which is uh, tiny uh, and it has inbuilt image and sound processing systems. You can buy these, uh, you can find these chips now in things like uh, the DGA Spark uh, uh, drone, which will do things like face recognition and recognize gestures. So it will come and land on your hand and things like this. And the chip that, 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 that's doing all the work here costs like $10. Now, I think the implications for employment of this sort of technology are far-reaching indeed. If you can replace human performance in many tasks at a fraction of the cost, um, well, many jobs are going to go. Driving jobs are going to disappear in the next few years uh, because you can have autonomous cars. Shop workers, agricultural workers, industrial workers, airport security staff, university lecturers. Uh, what about simultaneous translation? You don't need to pay people. You can do it on your mobile phone now. Many articles are written by, by, uh, by computers now, and medical specialists can be uh, uh, replaced by, uh, by deep learning systems. For instance, Google recently announced that they have a system which diagnoses cancer better than a pathologist with unlimited time. These jobs uh, are going to go, not just unskilled jobs, but even skilled jobs are going to disappear. Now, deep learning can actually only do tasks with, which humans already know how to do because you need supervised learning with lots of training data. So you know, if you can find a medical specialist who can uh, classify mammograms into cancer, non-cancer uh, uh, enough times, then they can be replaced by deep learning. You could argue that these systems are not really intelligent, though, uh, uh, because they basically can only do things that humans already know how to do. But even that is changing. Uh, a recent article by uh, DeepMind, which uh, was brought up by uh, Google, uh, showed that they can um, get a system that will learn to play the game Go without any human knowledge at all. It just learns everything from scratch using a reinforcement learning scheme where basically it just plays, you give it the rules of Go and then it just plays clones of itself such that after you know 40 hours of training and actually tens of millions of game, uh, complete games of Go, it's actually not only beating the previous uh, world's best uh, human players, but also the previous uh, 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 AlphaGo system. And there's probably no stopping this sort of, uh, this sort of technology. I'm, I would still say this isn't really uh, true, true intelligence. Uh, uh, humans can find repeating patterns with no instructions, but it turns out that even even that may be something we can do in artificial uh, systems. We've been working in, our, in my lab on a, an algorithm called JAST, uh, named after its four inventors, Jake, my postdoc, Amir, student, uh, myself, and Tim, uh, Tim Maskelier. And this, this algorithm will find actually anything that repeats with no need for supervision. And it will run on a $100 uh, chip the, uh, called an FPGA. It's the little black thing in the center of this picture here. And we're thinking about future chips, which have millions of neurons on them with billions of connect connections, synapses, and capable of processing trillions of spikes every second. And um, this sort of technology has been licensed by Brainchip Incorporated, um, which may well be able to produce a sort of technology in the relatively near future. So with all these uh, incredibly powerful technologies coming on and the ability to make these chips for so cheaply, I think we're heading for a catastrophe. At least we are if we continue with the current economic model. But not if we act now, uh, because there is a solution, and that solution is a universal base, basic income. Essentially, if people are, uh, are unable to earn money from working because their, their jobs are being replaced by robots, then who's going to buy the goods? You actually have to give people money to uh, uh, to be able to make the, <laughs> the system work. Now, basic, basic income has actually been proposed recently in the French presidential elections by one of the candidates, Benoit Armand, who is proposing a minimum um, 600 uh, euros a month um, um, after a certain time. But his main problem was he was unable to answer the main criticism, where are you going to find the 300 to 400 billion euros a year that you need to finance this? But it turns out that there are actually ways of doing this. And I'm going to suggest three possible ways you could finance uh, a universal basic income. One is using negative income tax. 
And the second is central bank money creation. And finally, a global financial transaction tax. Let's take these in turn. Firstly, basic income. Well, is it actually an idea? Uh, uh, the idea of uh, using a negative income tax was actually proposed by the uh, neoliberal economist Milton Friedman back in the 60s. This is in 1968. He's arguing for this. And the idea was actually almost implemented by Richard Nixon, who in 1969 was proposing to introduce a, a, a basic income to, uh, to, uh, to, to essentially replace the welfare system. Now, I've been looking at this in the case of France, uh, where uh, it's a bit complicated, but the blue line on this graph shows income, mon monthly income as a, as a function of the percentile of uh, 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 where you are in the population. So it turns out that about roughly 10% of the French population don't earn anything, and then that, that amount increases as you go across, uh, until the top percent, a uh, couple of percent of the population are earning over 10,000 euros a month. Now, the idea is that you would provide a minimum 600 euros a month by, uh, to everybody. That's the yellow line, but you'd have a, a flat tax at 30% on all additional earned income. And that gives you the yellow curve, which is the monthly in re revenue with basic income. Now, it turns out there's a neutral point, uh, the green dotted line there, which is at 2,100 euros a month. That's the point where your, uh, the tax you pay on your income cancels out the, uh, the, uh, the 600 euros a month that you get as a basic income. And that, what, what that means is that the top 39% of, uh, of earners pay into the system and the bottom 61% receive money from the system. But this system is totally balanced. I mean, it, there is no money. It doesn't cost anything. It's just a redistribution of existing revenue. Now, uh, it turns out that uh, the idea of a 30% flat tax has already been adopted in France. Um, we, uh, we've just voted a 30% flat tax on investment income. So money that you earn from you know, uh, shares and things like that is being uh, subjected to a 30% flat, flat tax for everybody. What I'm suggesting is just applying the same 30% tax rate to all income, not just investment income, income but uh, with the addition of the, uh, uh, the 600 euro a month uh, flat tax. Now, in fact, uh, you can have any, uh, uh, any level of basic income you like. Uh, the yellow curve is, is the 600 euros a month uh, offer, which you needs about 30% flat tax. But if you, if you want for, uh, 800 a month, you just increase that to 40%, or 50% tax would give you 1,000 a month. Again, all entirely paid for uh, within the tax system. The 39% of the richest people pay for the 61% at the bottom. And, and what's interesting, I think, is that you can see from this graph that you're, it's actually progressive. Uh, your tax rates that, with these different flat rate taxes above 2,100 are progressive. Uh, even if you're earning, earning 10,000 a month, you, uh, 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 you're still not paying 50% uh, tax. You're only paying less than 40% tax on your total income. So I think this is doable. Another method uh, is uh, uh, to use central bank money creation. It turns out that the European Central Bank has, been purch has purchased over 2 trillion euros worth of assets on the financial markets since 2014. I've got the whole figures here. That's uh, uh, about 80 billion a month for many of the months in this period. That's about 6,100 euros for every one of the 330 million people living in the Eurozone. Nearly 200 euros a month per person, or 800 euros a month for a family of four. Now, um, many people, including some uh, 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 prominent economists, are saying you know, that the central banks should not be uh, propping up the financial markets. They should just use this money creation and just put it into people's pockets. It's called quantitative easing for people. Uh, the third way I would suggest that we can finance uh, a basic income is by taxing uh, global financial transactions, or in fact, uh, 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 all electronic transactions. Uh, I've done the sums based on the Bank for International Settlements, which uh, totals over 11 quadrillion uh, euro, uh, dollars worth of transactions in 2016. And here we have the 
uh, totals over the last, uh, uh, since 2006, over $117 quadrillion worth of transactions. That's a one with 17 uh, zeros after it. It's a huge amount. Uh, and I've been proposing that if you imposed a 0.1% a, 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 a financial transaction tax on all of that stuff, you could actually finance an unconditional basic income at 50% of median income for everybody on the entire planet. Okay, The total cost of that would be 10.6 trillion, which is a big number, but it's less than 0.1% uh, of the global tran financial transactions, which, as I say, were 11 quadrillion in 2016. So you could finance the whole thing if everybody just paid 0.1% on every transaction we make. Why don't we do it? I don't know. So, take-home messages. $10 chips using deep learning are already replacing many skilled jobs. And, and future self-learning chip, chips could even replace jobs that require intelligence. Under such conditions, I think that continuing with the current economic system will lead to a catastrophe. People will, will not have any work, they will not be able to feed themselves, uh, and we're going heading for a bloody revolution, in my opinion. But there are solutions, and those solutions involve uh, uh, providing people with a basic universal income, and I, I've suggested three perfectly valid ways of doing that, which can be combined. And the bottom, bottom line is, actually, I think, I'm, a, I'm an optimist, I think this, 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 this incredible cheap AI and neural te network technologies, which can be used to power sophisticated robotic systems, could lead to a, actually at a very attractive, almost utopian society in which people are free to do the things they really want to do, looking after other people, doing creative things like art and music and theatre. We could be living in a sort of new Greek age where we don't have slaves, we have robots. I think this is actually something that we can all look forward to, but we need to change the system now. Thanks.